Christ is the understanding that we are in him and he is in us. And what counts for him has counted for us. His obedience. We, his obedience counts for us. His death counts for us. His burial counts for us. His resurrection counts for us. We've died with Christ. We've buried with Christ. We've risen with Christ. What was for him is for us. We are united to him. Hey Richard Fellowship, it's Oni here. I am super excited about this new series that we're about to jump into. Now, Christmas is around the corner, and so every year what we do is we take time to kind of walk through the scriptures, looking to understand why this season is important for us as the church. It's called Advent. We are in the Advent part of the year and so we're going to be diving into God's word and looking at the coming the first coming of Jesus Christ now Advent is a season marked by anticipation and waiting remembering the first coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we anticipate his return one day when he will make all things new again and so the question on the table is this how do we faithfully watch and wait in the Advent season. One of the postures of doing that is by singing. And so in this Advent series that we've titled The Songs of Advent, uh, we're going to be looking at a few passages that would remind us of the goodness of Jesus. I'm excited about that and so should you. But what I'm also excited about is that we get Sikle Kuhn to come and lead us in this Advent series. He's gonna be our teaching pastor for the next couple of weeks. Uh, there'll be a few others speaking here and there, but he's gonna be leading us through this Advent series. And I am super, super excited because, man, Sikle is a phenomenal preacher. He's one of the best. Uh, he was with us for about two years uh, doing a church planting residency together with his wife, Latavo. And then we sent them out to go and plant a church. Renewal Fellowship is her name in the east of Johannesburg uh, earlier this year. And they're doing some amazing, amazing works. I'm just hearing encouraging stories of all that God is doing. Actually, they had a baptism service a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sure he'll share a little bit about that. Um, but I'm excited. I really am excited. I really feel that you are going to get uh, no better preaching in this season as we unpack our Advent series. And, and so, uh, Rooted Fellowship, would you give C. Clay a warm welcome as he comes up and preaches God's word as he leads us through this Advent series. Give us fresh bread, my brother. Hey fam, uh, Rooted Fellowship, it's good to be with you once again. It's like third week in a row. I feel like I'm part of the furniture here, uh, but it's, it's really, it's a real joy for me to be going through this series with you, this series in Advent. We are now in um, song number three. We've looked at uh, the Song of Mary, we've looked at Song of Zechariah, and this week we're looking at the Song of the Angels. Now again, I'm going to say this again, that the goal for this series is, is it to be realistic? Is it, is it for, for, for this series to uh, come into our ordinary lives? What does it mean for the coming of Jesus? What does the coming of Jesus mean for our ordinary lives? And this is what Advent is supposed to do. Advent is supposed to get us in touch with our longings, with our, uh, the realities um, of life. And start thinking, what does it mean for Jesus to come in that? And what does it mean for us to live in this tension of Jesus has come, but he's still coming again? You know, the, the kingdom being now, um, but not yet. What, what, what does it look like to live in that in-between life? And that's what we're doing with, with Advent. So now we're looking at the, the song of the angels. Now what's so interesting about this song, I mean, with the song of Mary, it was, again, just sung around uh, the people and with, with the song of Zechariah and, and, and um, 
uh, Elizabeth you know, sung uh, with, with them and the angels, I mean with, with them, but this one is the angels and the choir of angels. It's almost like it has this cosmic aspect of the song, this announcement that comes and the response from heaven or this declaration from heaven or from this song coming from heaven confirming the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I want to do for us right now, I'm going to read a text. If you've got a Bible, grab your Bible, grab your device. We're going to be in Luke 2, from verse 8 all the way to verse 14. Luke 2, I'm going to read for us and then I'm going to pray. So Luke uh, chapter 2 from verse uh, 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the, of their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, that, they will, that, they, that will be for all of people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in the manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This is God's word. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is life, brings life to us. I pray now that your spirit will be at work, bringing these words that I speak into life, into people, especially as we watch from home, watching from um, this just technology, through technology, I pray that your spirit will be at work even in, in those platforms. So be with us, strengthen us through your word, but point us once again to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Now what, we will, what I, I would want to do today is literally just focus on the song. I know for, for, for Zechariah we, we saw, uh, we did a lot of, of, of context, but, but here I, I do want to go straight to the song in verse, in verse 14. And what we see here is an angel comes uh, to announce the great news of great joy. It says in verse 10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. That's what we see, the, 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 the angel coming to anu announcing this. Then what we see is this choir appearing, this angelic choir, this heavenly company, a great company of heavenly hosts coming and start singing. This is called the Gloria, the Gloria, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rest. I do want to focus on this verse, verse 14. And what I would like to do is to actually go through this verse in a backward manner. So we're going to start from the, 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 the end of the verse going back to the front. So we, we're going to start from on whom his favor rests. That's, that's sort of the end of the verse. I want to work us through, through the verse backwards, backwards. So we're going to start with, it says, and on earth peace to man on whom his favor rests, on whom his favor rests. In other translation, it says, with whom he is pleased. On earth be peace with whom he is pleased. And then it says, glory to God. Now again, this is what we see here, this peace, you know, this, this peace that is coming on earth is not just for, for gener generic people. It's not just uh, for all, as it were. It, it has some specifics. It says it is peace that is coming uh, from, to those in whom God's favor rests. It is f for those whom God is pleased. In other translation, it says. Now, now I can tell, even just looking at that, whom his favor rests and whom he's pleased, 
that some of us get, can get worried when we hear that. Peace on earth sounds great, good news, but peace to the one God favors, to the one God is pleased with, that sounds like, mm, what, what if I'm not there? What if does, this does not include me? You know, for, for some of us, it can give us flashbacks in, in high school when we didn't get picked for the team. We, we're not good enough. We're not pleasing for whoever was choosing the team. We didn't get picked first. And now when it says, from whom God's favor rests, am I included in that? What if I'm not? What if I'm not who he's pleased with? What do I do? What do I do to win his favor? When we, when we think of the ones who seems like God's favor rest, sometimes we can equate that with what the world calls success. There are people that we think, oh, definitely, this is whom the favor of God rests. They're doing great. For some of us, even at this time, with everything we are going through, we would literally be like, there's no way the, fa the favor of God is resting upon me. So this is definitely not for me. Because we, we are equating this to the way the world looks at success. So you may look at that and say, that, that must be favor. Look at this person. They're doing great. The, the kids are healthy. The work is great. Everything. This is whom this verse is talking about. Or not just the way... Or well, maybe not that, not just the, the, the success of the world, but it could be the religious view of the deserving. You know, it might not be the, 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 the success of the world, but it could, it, it could be whom God favor rest because they're not necessarily rich and, and, and successful, but they are, you know, righteous and deserving and doing all the good Christian stuff. The way, you know, they've got the religious thing going. And you're saying, that's not me. I'm hardly reading my Bible. I'm hardly praying. Don't even mention church. Haven't been there in a while. You know, pandemic has been a good excuse. So I, I, I'm not the one. I'm not worthy. So this peace that this Messiah is bringing to, the, to, the, to those people whom God's favor rests is definitely not for me. So if you are like that, if you are thinking, this is not for me, I don't fit neither of these things, there's no hope for me, how is this good news for me? I like what uh, one author, Henry Nowen, once said. He said, when you don't see yourself as the favored one, talking about, you know, favored from God, when you don't see yourself as the favored one, suffering becomes the confirmation of your rejectedness. I'm going to let that sink in. He's saying, you know, if, if you have looked at this thing and said, you know what, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't count on this. I'm not the success as the world see it, but I'm not as religious as all of these people. This, this is not for me. I'm not worth it. He's saying when you don't see yourself as the favored one, Suffering becomes the confirmation. So maybe you, that's exactly where you are. I'm not successful. I am not a good Christian. You know, I'm, like, I'm not good at being good, being a Christian. And therefore, all of these things that are happening to me, they're just confirming that I'm, they're confirming that I'm not, this is not, my, God's favor does not rest on me. Suffering becomes the confirmation of your rejectedness. Is that where you are? <coughs> excuse me. Are you feeling that, excuse me, are you feeling that everything that is happening to you is happening because God's favor does not rest on you? You have not been religious enough. You are not doing, you are not successful enough. Is suffering a confirmation of your rejectedness? And this text wants to speak to that. To say, actually, no, you, you're thinking through the, this lens. You're looking at this in the wrong lens. And you see that and we, as we look through the, the narrative of Luke, Luke, as he, 
as he writes his gospel, you, you begin to see that in, throughout this whole narrative, throughout this whole uh, gospel, Luke shows us that the Messiah comes to those who are ostracized, to those who see that they, they've been rejected, to those, these are the people the Messiah is coming for. When you have this narrative that you are not, you, you don't have the favor of God, something bad should be happening to you, you see this proof that you are rejected by God. But when you see, when you look closely at the story, you will see something. You will see even that even with the angels coming, they are announcing this good news to shepherds. They are announcing this good news to, to the ordinary shepherds, young boys who nobody's looking at. And they are the ones who get the news. This blue collar, not regarded in, in society, they, 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 they are the ones on the, on the margins of society. And these are the ones who are getting this news. And this is what we see throughout the book of Luke. The book of Luke, you read the book of Luke, you will see, you will be surprised on how much he shows that the gospel is shared with the outsiders, with those in the margins with those who have been viewed not religious. Luke comes for them. He is writing all of this to say the Messiah is coming for them. Luke's narrative across the board is the message that the good news arriving to the people who don't seem like they deserve it. If you don't, if you think you don't deserve it, you're the right candidate. Is that if you don't feel you deserve God's grace, if you don't feel you deserve God's favor, you're the right candidate. God's favor is coming to those who are unlikely, who don't have it all together, least expected, undeserving. This is who God is going for. This is how radical the good news of grace is. This is why I love the gospel. It is saying for you, who feel like you don't have it together. This is, this is what you need. You just need to have the need for God. Not to have it all together. This is who God comes for. That it is the news of grace. That God will give a gift to the unworthy. To, 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 to the, that God will give his son for sinners. It's a scandal. The, the incredible scandal of God's grace. And we struggle to believe this. We see it, we read it, but we struggle to believe this. Because we have this view of God that is Father Christmassy, that is Santa Clausy. It's in our minds, we have that view of God. You know, I, I don't know much about Santa Claus or Father Christmas, but from what I you know, what I hear in the movies or what I, what I see, he's always got this question that he asks people that, he, that he's going to give the gifts. You know, have, have you been a good boy this year? Have you been a good, good girl this year? And there you go. And he, he, give, he, he gives gifts according to, have you been good this year? And this is our view of God. And it could not be, it could never be far away from who God is. You know, he, he, Santa, Santa gives gifts according to the people's goodness. You know, sometimes don't you just wish you could say to Santa, no, I haven't been good. And neither have you been good, Santa. And that's not how gifts work, Santa. No, I haven't been good. It doesn't work like that. You don't give good gifts to people because they are good. You don't give gifts to people because they are good. You give them gifts because they are loved. That's the, that's, that's the, the premise in where God is coming from. He's not giving us his son. He's not giving us all that he's giving us because we've been good. He's giving us because he, we are loved. We are loved people. The gift of God comes to the unworthy. It is precisely because we don't deserve it that makes us qualify. So when it says here that on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests, on whom his favor rests, 
His favor is resting on the undeserving. It is resting on the unworthy. It is resting on those who, who, who are saying, I've, I've blown it again to, this year. I've done, I've gone deep into sin. I feel like there's no coming back. God's grace, God's favor is coming for you. God's favor is resting upon those who are unworthy. Upon those who feel they've blown it. God is coming for them. Now, again, we're going backwards. And then it says, on earth, peace to men. Now, let's talk about this peace. Peace to men. Now, here's what's going to rest upon those who God favors. This peace. Now, this word peace, it would have a couple of resonances for people who read Luke's gospel. There was a, a Roman sense of peace that came with the, the, the Caesar that was there at that time, Octavian. Now, Octavian had won this great battle years back before the birth of Jesus, and he changed his name. He gave his name Augustus, which is what we see here. Uh, um, and there was, uh, it says, in the, in the days of Caesar Augustus. He, th that is the name he has given himself. Augustus is just, this, 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 it means the great one. He has won this battle and he calls himself the great one. And he has said that he's bring, he's ushering in a Pax Roman. It was called Pax Roman. Pax Roman is this Roman peace. This is literally hi history. This is what I love about the, the gospel. It's just a historical stuff. This is secular history. You know, this, this Pax Roman. But it was a false peace. It was a false peace because, the, the, you know, there was still oppression with the Jews. The, the whole empire was built on uh, the slavery, the oppression of Jewish people, among others. But this angel that is coming, this Messiah that is coming, he's also bringing peace. He's also bringing uh, peace. And, and therefore, even this news, there's a sense that it, it is counter is a counter political claim. There is one who calls himself Lord, Caesar, Augustus. There is, that one is also, he's saying he's bringing peace, but we know his peace is not real peace. But here's this, there's, there's this one who's been born. This Lord. And with him, real peace is coming. But to understand this true meaning of peace meant here, again, we need to lay down the Roman understanding of peace and pick up the, the, the peace in a Jewish lens. You know, in a Jewish lens. The, the Hebrew word for peace is this word shalom, which means completeness, which means wellness, which means soundness, well-being, flourishing, shalom. This is the peace that has been spoken about here, where nothing is broken, nothing is missing. There is shalom. Advent is promising shalom on earth. Shalom is coming in. Shalom is breaking in with the coming of the Messiah. Peace on earth. Peace in the midst, in the midst of, of humanity wrapped up in the person of Jesus. That's shalom. I like what Lisa Sharon Harper says when she's talking about Shalom. She says, God created the world in the web, in a, God created the world in a web of relationships that overflowed with forceful goodness. These relationships are far reaching between humanity and God, humanity and self, between genders, male and female, between humanity and between the rest of creation, between families, between racial groups, between nations. These relationships were very good at the beginning. One word that characterized them was shalom. This is what we saw in Genesis 1 and 2 with everything that God is looking at, relationship between his people and them. They're in a good relationship. They're in a good relationship with one another. They're in a good relationship with creation. Everything screams shalom. It's peace. And that tells us that the chaos in our world is not the way things are supposed to be. 
The chaos in our lives are not the way things are supposed to be. In fact, when we look at Genesis 3, because I feel like sometimes even when we look at Genesis 3, we have a different sense of what really went wrong when sin entered the world. Sometimes we may think of it individualistically. To say when sin came into the world, it messed up our relationship with God. And that's it. And that's true. It messed up our relationship with God. We're now rebelling against God. But it was not only that. Sin brought a vandalism, a a, a, a defracturing of shalom. That all things that were good have now been decimated. All things. Relationship with God, relationship with one another, relationship with self, relationship with creation. All those things are now vandalized, as it were. And the promise of the Messiah is the promise of the one who will come and usher in a kingdom filled with shalom. That's what we, we, we're speaking about here as the coming of Jesus. He is, he's the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. He's bringing shalom with him. Shalom with self. What do we want shalom with self? Shalom with one another, relationships. Sometimes it is so interesting that we actually don't take uh, 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 um, the, the greatest command, as it were. When, the, when the, the, the Pharisees asked Jesus what would be the greatest command, Jesus said, they, in fact, they wanted him to say one thing. What is the greatest command? What is the thing that is the, at the core of obeying God? Jesus could not be cornered to say one thing. He said, love God. As you love, love, love God, but also love your neighbor as you love yourself. I, th- there's no way I can put these things apart. Love God, but love others. Those things go together. In fact, loving others is showing that you're loving God. Loving God is showing that you're loving others. And sometimes we want to divide that. And there's, you, you can't divide it. There's no way you can divide it. There's no way you can just say, I just want to have a relationship with God. Who cares about other people? Who cares if I've got good relationships? You've missed the faith. You've you've missed the core of what this is all about. Loving God involves loving others. And then when God wants to restore, give us shalom with himself, he wants to give us shalom with others. He wants to give us shalom with others. Others. Jesus has come to restore shalom in our lives. I'm glad, actually, uh, I know Richard Fellowship, Richard Fellowship had uh, done um, uh, a series on emotional health because that's part of um, this understanding of shalom within self. What does it mean for, for, the, for, the, for the well-being or the wholeness, that God is bringing wholeness into our lives? the shalom in us. God is bringing this this shalom, and we need to take some inventory in our lives. What is broken in your life? Where do you need shalom? Where is shalom broken in your relationships? Just with God? With with yourself? Are you full of shame? Are you full of brokenness? With people around you? With family? In your marriage? In your singleness? Our prayer, Lord, come, Jesus, bring shalom, bring peace. And you know what the result in that will be. When you, when, you, when you are the favored one, as we spoke about, when you understand that you are the favored one, when you see that the work of shalom, the, 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 the work of peace is starting in you, is starting in this world by the coming of the Messiah, the, the, the only thing that will happen is a song of joy. The only result from that is what the angels are saying here. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Because we see that praise is the completion of joy. Praise is where joy is going to. Praise is the telos of joy. It is the goal of joy. This is where joy is going 
all along. There's no, joy leads to, it leads to praise. I like what C.S. Lewis says about this. C.S. Lewis says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is the appointed consummation. He's saying praise is not just an expression, but praise is where it all leads to. It is, is, the, is, is the consummation of your joy. Your joy is not complete until it leads to praise. Until it leads to praise. In fact, we, we live like that. It's not even something that is, uh, you could think uh, it's abstract. That's how we live. We know that when we are enjoying something, we want to tell someone about it. That's, that's sort of our way of praise. It is, frust- it is so frustrating when you have found something good. You found a good book, but then you're not able to tell anyone how good it is. That's the goal of enjoyment. That's the goal of joy. To say, I found this. Who can I tell? I need to praise this to someone. In fact, the the Westminster Catechism says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But what we should know is that glorifying God and enjoying him forever is, is the one and the same thing. These are not... Two things. It's the same thing. C.S. Lewis comes back again and he says, fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. The goal of joy is to glorify, is to praise. The command to glorify God is an invitation to enjoy him. And when we understand that, when we understand that we are the ones that God favors, not because of our goodness, but because we feel unworthy, we aren't deserving, but we are the ones that God is going for. But what is he bringing? He's bringing shalom. In this advent is the advent of shalom, the, the breaking in of peace. Not just peace in the world, but peace in our lives. To repair everything that's broken. And the goal, the telos, where all this is leading to is to our joy and to the glory of God. To the glory of God in the highest. And when we get that good news, it will turn us into messengers. It will turn us like these angels. Like the, in fact, the, 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 the word for angel means messenger those who have been sent by God. When we get this good news, it leads us, it turns us into messengers. We become agents of shalom to the world. That's that's why we even plant churches. That's why we are part of this communities we are part of. We need to be agents of shalom. I'm reminded of what God says to the exiles in Jeremiah. He's saying, listen, stay here. You are here in Babylon. Stay, build houses, grow families, pray for the shalom of the city. Be the agents of shalom. But you can't bring shalom if you don't possess shalom. And therefore our prayer is that God will do a work in us. He will dig deep in us and repair what's broken. For us individually, individually, but also for us as a community. God, may you bring shalom in our community. That we can be agents of shalom in our city. That's what Advent is bringing. Advent is this ushering of the kingdom of God through the person of Jesus to bring shalom. So that our joy may be, free, may be full and we can praise glory to God in the highest. I'm praying for us, even at this time, as difficult as it it is, that our prayer for us in this period, this Christmas period, just one prayer I'm praying that we would pray. Lord, heal us, bring shalom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. 
Once again, I would like to say that prayer again. Lord, I pray, heal us, bring shalom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.